Welcome back to Signal Ditch. As always, I'm Nick, and today we're going to be talking about this high vacuum system as well as the fully custom system controller that I built to evacuate handmade vacuum tubes like these. Last time we talked about this system, most of the mechanical portion was already plumbed together, and I could pump the system down and bring it back up by manually actuating all of the relays and valves involved. But the end goal was always to put it under automatic control. Not only because I would have my hands full with other things while I'm pumping down a tube and may not be able to watch all of the gauges, make sure that nothing's going wrong, but even if I see that something's going wrong, I may not have enough time to react, whereas a microcontroller whose only job is to monitor the system will be able to react in time to shut valves and prevent pumps from getting bogged down with overpressure or prevent oil from getting sucked out of the mechanical pump into high vacuum parts of the circuit. All of these bad things that can happen when you're trying to do this manually, just watching gauges and turning dials. In order to understand why we need a controller, let's take a look at this diagram of the vacuum system. The vacuum system contains four separate high vacuum valves, which are capable of dividing the system into three separate sections. The top section is the evacuation port. This is where we'll connect our devices that we want to evacuate. This section also contains a Pirani gauge so that we know when it's safe to expose the section to the running turbo pump. The next section is the turbo section. This comprises the turbo molecular pump, the hot ion gauge, and another Pirani gauge. And finally, at the bottom, we have the roughing section. The roughing section comprises the roughing pump, the four-line, the four-line trap, and the four-line vent. So what is the controller's job? Its first job is to sequence the evacuation. When you pump down the system, everything has to happen in a particular order, otherwise you could damage the system. For instance, you can't turn on the hot ion gauge until the turbo pump is running and that portion of the system is already at high vacuum. The turbo pump itself can't be turned on until the roughing pump has already been running and you know that that portion of the system is already at rough vacuum. The same is true during shutdown. It's important not to expose any part of the system that isn't ready to atmospheric pressure. As a matter of convenience, it would be nice if the controller would simplify port isolation. What I mean is that it would be nice if at the press of a button, it would sequence all of the valves so that I know the top end of the system or the evacuation port is isolated from the rest of the system before I do things like tip off a device or remove a device to repair it and then replace it later. The controller should also handle returning the port to vacuum at the press of a button. Finally, the controller should act as a watchdog to prevent certain dangerous states from occurring. These states could occur either as a matter of operator error if you were doing this manually, or during a malfunction. Exposing the running turbo molecular pump to atmosphere, either through breaking a tube under evacuation, or by opening the wrong valves and exposing the inlet port of the turbo to either the four-line or the four-line vent. Exposing the hot ion gauge to atmosphere. The controller should make sure that any time there's a path between the ion gauge and either atmosphere or rough vacuum that the ion gauge is already turned off. Having the roughing pump exposed to a part of the system that's at high vacuum without it running, which could cause oil to backstream into the high vacuum portion of the system and the sudden loss of four-line vacuum, either through malfunction of the roughing pump or by opening the wrong valve and venting the four-line while the turbo is still running. Both of these things would damage the turbo molecular pump. In order to sense and control the vacuum system, the controller will need multiple inputs and outputs. Both Pirani gauges, as well as the hot ion gauge, are connected to a vacuum gauge controller, which has analog outputs which will be wired to the controller. In addition, the turbo molecular pump has a proportional speed output, which will allow the controller to know what state it's in. And because we can rely on this particular turbo pump to be pretty smart, we can use that speed as a sort of fault detection. If the turbo pump suddenly starts slowing down for no apparent reason, it's probably the turbo controller trying to protect it from some kind of fault. In order to affect the system, the controller will have several outputs. Perhaps most obviously, it'll have control over all of the high vacuum valves. In addition, it'll be able to turn both vacuum pumps on and off. 
This system is so straightforward that it would be reasonable to build it out of old industrial ladder logic controllers or even relay logic, but nowadays it's much more common to just throw an Arduino at it, so that's what I did. I decided to design a board that essentially acts as a shield for the 5V Arduino Pro. The microcontroller that the Arduino Pro is based around is an ATmega328P, which has a handful of ADCs and a bunch of GPIO, as well as serial communication built in. The ADCs are going to be especially useful to us since we have all of these analog output signals from this vacuum equipment that we want to be able to keep track of. Now, because the Arduino Pro is a 5 volt system, I did need to rescale all of the ADC inputs to make sure that they would be tolerant of signals up to 10 volts. In order to do this, I put each ADC on a 1 to 1 voltage divider and then added a reverse biased Schottky diode to ensure that the voltage on the top of the voltage divider could never get above 10 volts, which means that the controller should only ever see 5 volts maximum. This covers all three analog signals from the vacuum gauges, as well as the analog speed signal from the turbo molecular pump. In order to actuate the high vacuum valves, I needed 24 volt signals to send to the relays. This is a simple matter of throwing some MOSFETs on there, as well as some flywheel diodes because you know that those relay coils are inductive loads. The status of the system is communicated through a bunch of LEDs on a panel. And while I could have used just basic 0603 indicator LEDs, addressable LEDs are so inexpensive now and save so much GPIO overhead that it was worth it just to throw a bunch of addressables on there. And then, because they're also RGB, I get an added amount of information that I can convey with each LED. Finally, there's a handful of mechanical keyboard switches which the user will use to interact with the controller. Of course, that left a few ADCs and a few GPIO, which were unused, and so I broke those out to headers as well, just in case I need to expand the system later. So I went ahead and ordered the boards from JLC PCB, and they got to me in about a week. The first thing I did was to make sure that all of my measurements were correct and that they were actually going to fit into the 19-inch equipment rack. Then I soldered all the parts in place, I hand soldered all of these APA 102s, and then I added the mechanical key switches and these little square keycaps that I think gives the whole controller a very industrial vibe that I'm really into. And then of course I had to wire everything into the controller, including both of the pump relays as well as these pneumatic relays which control all of the high vacuum valves. All of the wiring goes straight up to the underside of the workbench where it's held in place with cable clamps and then it makes its way across the bottom of the workbench, up through a desk grommet, and to the back of the equipment rack. Here we can get a nice close look at the awful wiring into the back of the controller, which I intend to fix one day and add some insulation, but before we can do that, there is one small problem that I need to solve. Damn, that sucks. This got fucked up in shipping worse than I thought. Well, you're up. Luckily on Facebook Marketplace, I found a guy like an hour away who had an identical pump. And as long as I was messing with the four line, I decided I'd go ahead and add a four line trap to the system. No, I didn't pay Edward's insane pricing for this part. I bought it used for like a fraction of the cost on eBay and then just recharged it with some cheap activated aluminum media um, that I also bought on eBay. I also decided to go ahead and add an oil mist eliminator to the output of the roughing pump because I was tired of cleaning up all of the oil mist that had accumulated on everything underneath the workbench. But I could still smell oil when the pump ran, so I decided for the sake of my own health to go ahead and stack that up with a DIY activated carbon filter, which I made out of these little sintered filter discs that I found on McMaster, as well as some PVC pipe from the hardware store.
For filter media, I went ahead and grabbed some cheap activated carbon, which is used for aquarium filters. Then I was able to connect the output of my oil mist eliminator to the input of my DIY filter. And then on the inlet side of the oil mist eliminator, I connected this large hose barb so that I could connect it to the vacuum hose that had come with the new replacement pump. This hose was originally the high vacuum inlet hose, and I swapped it over to the outlet. After testing, I mounted the filter underneath the workbench using a couple of pipe hangers. And speaking of mounting things, I changed the mounting on the turbo molecular pump because I was a little bit paranoid about a leak developing in that huge flange. I didn't like the way that these clamps sat when I tried to put the entire clamp underneath the mounting plate, so I just got rid of half the clamp and pretended that the mounting plate was actually an ISO F mounting flange, and that worked great. Just bolting it directly up to the flange and letting the mounting plate compress the o-ring. I rearranged the top end of the system and added a pipe hanger so that there was a little bit more mechanical rigidity and less torque could be put on that flange connection. After that was all sorted, I got out my Dymo label maker and I put labels on everything. With everything labeled and squared away, I went ahead and ran some test firmware on the controller that allowed me to manually actuate all of the valves and read all of the gauges over the serial port. Once I had verified the hardware worked, I went to a full test of the automated firmware. Thanks for hanging out to the end of the video. I know it's been a while since I've published anything, and a big part of that is that I was extremely busy doing fulfillment for a crowd supply campaign that I launched last year. The fulfillment is finally done, and people are receiving their hardware, so now that I have that behind me, I can get back to business working on my vacuum tube stuff. Also, I just haven't had a lot of money to spend on this project, which is where the Patreon has really come in clutch. The patrons and I basically went halfsies on the replacement mechanical pump, which ended up being crucial to getting this project finished when I realized that the old one had sprung a leak. They've also helped me purchase consumables, like glass tubing and tungsten wire and gas for the torch. They've even foot most of the development bill for the lathe, which is what I hope to tell you about in the next video. If you'd like to pitch in to help make these videos possible, you can go to patreon.com slash integrated therm, where for any amount of money per month, you can see these videos at least 24 hours ahead of time. 
It's also a great place to get in touch with me to ask questions about anything that you've seen in my videos. I also post occasional updates, behind the scenes things, photos, things that don't really make sense to post on YouTube. For $10 a month, you get all of that, plus your name appears at the end of every YouTube video, just like the names that you're seeing on screen right now. Well, that's all I've got for you today, but I'm gonna go get busy on the next video, where we're gonna talk about the glass lathe project and maybe even put together a little vacuum triode. God damn, it's fucking hot in here.